Um, hi, everybody. We are here today um, and we're going to be speaking with um, uh, uh, Louise Dumas, who I have known for a very long time. Um, we've also got Melanie um, Jangra, who's one of our uh, tutors with Happy Learning with us as well, because we're going to do a recording in um, both French and English, but we'll start out with English first. So, um, uh, like I've known Louise for a long time and she um, has a background as a registered nurse. She's an educator. She's been a university professor. Um, she completed her post um, doc studies in Sweden with um, uh, um, you know, your mentor, um, the most beautiful person, Anneli Winstrom, who I know became a wonderful friend of yours. Um, and like, we've known each other forever and I have always been amazed um, uh, by your work that you do but also your energy so um, <laughs> Louise coming from a... you <laughs> <laughs> so Louise tell us a bit about your history and how you got to where we were today okay my history um I've been working in hospital most of my life uh, before going to university. So uh, yeah, with the baccalaureate and then the master's in the States. And then when I came back, it was interdisciplinary education at the doctoral level. And then life was very good with me and sent me to Sweden where I met, like you said, Anne-Marie Wittström. Anne-Marie had been my mentor and good friend and she was really, uh, essential for me to go further and further in research, yes, but further in understanding the basics for breastfeeding BFHI. Even if she was not really a BFHI person, she was really baby person with the skin to skin and looking at the baby and the baby here and the baby there. We had to remind her that uh, there was a mother also, but I mean, it was really, I learned a lot there. And this was parallel to me being lead assessor for um, the Baby Friendly Initiative. So I, I represented Canada at the, what we call the BFHI network for industrialized countries since 2006. Mm -hmm. And being in Sweden from 2004 to 2014, so it, it was all parallel. So one helped with the other, <laughs> the, uh, what I was doing in Sweden and what I was doing in Canada here. So that's, that's brilliant. So you've got an incredibly um, international perspective um, when we look at uh, the Baby, Baby Friendly Initiative. So um, I know you retired. OK, <laughs> yet yeah, you do a lot of volunteer um, uh, you know, time on many, many projects. Um, and one of those is part of the five um, org collaborative. Can you tell us a little bit about um, uh, this collaborative and how uh, it came about? Yeah. Uh, and I'm retired from university <laughs> and I finished, you know, mentoring my students at the baccalaureate and doctoral level and master's level, but I'm not retired from life. So no. life is still <laughs> lots of volunteer work. And since I was representing um, Canada, the BFHI network, I got also involved with um, the new guidance that was coming out. So um, by 2016 at the BFHI network, we were working with WHO and UNICEF to kind of uh, help with that uh, revitalization of the, the 10 steps in the BFHI um, program. And then uh, at the network, we thought we needed to have more support from uh, more international organizations. So we reached out to um, what we call the five orgs, mm -hmm. which is the network, reach out to ILCA and IBFAM and WABA and La Leche League International. So everybody that was uh, preoccupied or concerned with breastfeeding mm -hmm. got together and worked with WHO and UNICEF and saying, okay, we agree with this. We don't agree with that. We should. So we help uh, really uh, WHO and UNICEF uh, to kind of uh, I don't know, better this um, uh, draft of a guidance. So we call it the five orgs now, breastfeeding collaborative or five orgs. And uh, we are still working with the WHO and UNICEF, but differently. After the guidance came out, then the WHA, the World Health Assembly said to WHO, well, it's very good, that new thing, but we need tools. So this is how, you know, the five orgs is still working into the 
uh, implementation of the guidance by developing tools, validating tools, and trying to have help and give help and support to um, member states to implement the, the guidance. Yeah. Okay, um, so yeah, going on to that step, this, this toolkit's come around because there's been a lot of changes with the BFHI, BFI, um, and very specific related to the step two um, part of yeah. this. So I know we've uh, got, if we, if we go through the, the documents, there's been a lot of changes related to the number of hours of education. Um, uh, yet I do know that still in the, the WHO documents, um, they do discuss a 22 hour um, type of training. But I'm also aware that there's many countries around the world that are getting very specific on to, okay, we've got to focus just, just sometimes um, on the, um, uh, the uh, competencies uh, and, I'm, and, and a much shorter education. So I'm sort of, I'm aware we now have what, what we call the importance of knowledge, skills and attitude, which I think is essential in what we're going, what's going forward with this. I also know there's a, seeming to be a lot of confusion um, uh, in in co different countries of oh, well, how do I do this? How do we get? How do we use this toolkit? How do we get um, uh, to like what hours do we need? What do we what do we do? How do we evaluate? How do we do all of these things? And so I you know I think we we all know that you need a really good solid. Um, uh, basis of knowledge, because if you don't have the knowledge and you can't put into practice, um, uh, you know, what you're doing, yet we all learn in different ways. Uh, and I also think that attitude is probably, a, a, probably even a more important, more important key, um, because that's how the message gets passed. And that's how parents, families, um, mothers feel um, like empowered, because it's how that person speaks to you. So the development of this toolkit is, you know, is really, really important. Um, and I know you've been part of this. So how, how would you like to share with us how, how to integrate this toolkit or information about the toolkit um, for us? Maybe I should come back a little and say yes. step two is only one of the changes that really yes. in the new guidance, but it's a major one. Yeah. And most of the countries and people did not realize how huge this change is. Mm -hmm. It's really a paradigm shift because before as a lead assessor, I was going work, you know, line by line, all the staff there and say 20 hours, 20 hours, oh, mm -hmm. not 20 hours, I have to interview this person, 20 hours, 20 hours, not looking at how is this 20 hours in the person itself? Is it just mm -hmm. about the knowledge level? And research has shown when they did the literature review at WHO that uh, really you need the skill and the attitude because just the knowledge doesn't work. So, um, the 20 hour efforts that were given in many countries didn't work. It didn't work out. So the shift is now, of course we need this, but what the WHO and UNICEF would like is to have it at the pre-service level. Mm -hmm. If we have everybody with the same knowledge mm -hmm. there, I have it all, the, the, the 64 performance indicators in the Chulkia at the knowledge level, Everybody should have it. And then when you come to hospital to work, according to what you're supposed to do, where you work, prenatal, pernatal, postnatal, all of that, then you're supposed to have skills and attitudes because you will be closer to the diet. So it, that, that shift means that instead of focusing on, I have to give 22 mm -hmm. hours, you don't have to give 22 hours. If you have a new employee, you have to check their competencies. Mm -hmm. And for this, you have the multiple choice questions mm -hmm. to start with, because like you said, if they don't have the knowledge, then they won't be able to have the skills and mm -hmm. maybe the attitudes, but all together you need. So that paradigm shift is not well understood yet. Mm -hmm. In some countries, they just said, oh, okay, this is what we have to integrate into our teaching. Mm -hmm. Yes, it could be. In the places where you don't have any training, mm -hmm. then the 20 hour, of course, is there. So, um, but most of the time, by my experience, you come to hospital 
this nurse has 20, uh, 20 years of experience. She worked elsewhere before. Did she learn something? Of course mm -hmm. she did. What did she learn? Is it okay with the toolkit, the, the performance indicators, the competencies we're expecting? If it is, why in the world would I send her to a 20-hour course? Instead, focus on what she would need to better in her knowledge, in her skills, in her attitudes. And this is the basis for the step two, the change. So um, since WHA, like the World Health Assembly, pushed on WHO say you need the tools, well, five fools of us. <laughs> <laughs> volunteered at the five orgs to develop a toolkit, you know, tools. It was not a toolkit to start with. It was a tool to verify the competencies at the clinical level, any type of competencies, whatever the healthcare professional working with uh, a dyad. So it, it ended up being a toolkit, but it was a long, long process. We really didn't realize and <laughs> we were involving ourselves. So the five of us just volunteered. We barely knew each other besides working, you know, in the, the five wards. But we were surprised ourselves to see how complementary we were, you know, because our experiences are different. Our background, professional backgrounds are different. We come from different continents, different cultures, different language. So it made a toolkit that was already almost international before we submitted it to experts. So it was really, and it's still, because we're still working into other tools to uh, help the implementation. So this is how it got there. So what it meant for us was really to, um, take in the guidance, the list of competencies that were there for step two. And then we first realized that this doesn't apply to hospital. Don't forget step two at the WHO is strictly for hospital. Like in Quebec and Canada and other countries, we have BFI for community health settings, professionally working there, but WHO, the guidance is for hospital. So when we looked, they were, competencies that did not belong there. I don't need to know what to do with mastitis when mm -hmm. the mother stays at a hospital for two days. Hopefully she won't have a mastitis in two days, mm -hmm. okay? So things like that, nothing about exclusivity of breastfeeding and the competencies. And then they were so vague, most of them, that you could fit anything in there. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we had to do is really refine the competencies and decide on what is a hospital competency that you need to know as a healthcare professional. Then uh, we had to, well, first we had to define what is, it, is the competencies in healthcare, mm -hmm. okay? And then uh, define, redefine the competencies. And then how in the world do you assess this? Do you verify this at the clinical level? Because the idea is not with the pre-service or in-service education, it's more, about verifying competencies. Mm -hmm. So we um, developed competence um, for each competencies, it was performance indicator, mm -hmm. things that you have it or you don't have it, mm -hmm. things I can see Please. when I look at you. And then we had to clarify very clearly what's the difference between training and competency verification. So at that point, when we had developed this first tool, we sent it to experts. Since we were in the five orgs, I mean, experts were easily available. So we had 20 experts from 17 countries and six international organizations reviewed this while we were working with the other tools because we had to develop the multiple choice question, the case studies and the observation tools. And we also did um, examiner's resource, how in the world the countries will be able to choose and train the examiners mm -hmm. for the disverification of competency. So uh, for us, it was a little bit more than what we thought <laughs> we <laughs> would be involved in. <laughs> so, and we're still working on it because the, the toolkit can be quite um, overwhelming. 
because it's huge, it's big. Um, it's, um, it was designed at first for verifying competencies at the clinical level. Mm -hmm. So it could be used in hospital like this, like on a unit mm -hmm. um, with a group of healthcare professionals, but it could be adapted easily for non-hospital settings with healthcare professional also. But then when the experts came back, they said, you know what, that would be interesting if you would also take those 64 performance indicators and present them as um, in the domains, in the perinatal mm. domains, because this is how most of us teach at the university level in all the countries. Mm -hmm. So it's the same, that's why toolkit is big, because it's the same 64 performance indicator that are organized either by 10 steps mm -hmm. or they're organized by seven perinatal domain, which are like prenatal, pernatal, mm -hmm. and you know. Yeah. So, and then the multiple choice questions are the same. The case studies are the same. Observation tools are the same because they are linked with the performance indicator. It's just a, same number, but organized differently. So maybe it's big, but I take either one. If I'm mm -hmm. teaching, for example, in pre-service, I will take the domain, it could be easier. Mm -hmm. But if I'm teaching within the 10 steps within the BFHI program, then it's clearer in my head if I present with the 10 steps. Mm -hmm. So that's a yeah, that's a really um, amazing way of organizing it. I know, um, uh, you know when we when we've looked at it, it, it does make it in my mind it does make it much easier looking at it from the, from the domain perspective. Because um, you're an educator. Yeah, yeah. Because we're going but I'm a lead levels. assessor. I will tell so you, like that. the ten yes. steps just are quick like this for me. Yeah. So yeah. either yeah. one. So so how. Um, like if you were looking at a, a speaking to a, a, um, a facilitator who is uh, been just said, okay, we're going towards the baby friendly process. We've done it previously like this. Um, what would be an easy step um, or an easy guideline for them, for that person to um, say, okay, I've got this toolkit now. Okay. Um, I'm, I know I have to get my education sorted. Um, I'm just trying to think what would be a, a, an, an easy or a, a really nice thing to be able to share with the educators of an easy way to integrate this new toolkit into their practice as they're continuing on their journey of BFI or BFHI. Okay, so you're talking about Key facilitator, yeah, yeah. facilitator and educators. For yes. me, it's two different things. So facilitators so in for the example, hospitals. Yeah. Let's say I'm a head nurse or yeah. a yes. clinical director in perinatal. Okay, yeah. Yeah. so I'm responsible for care and services on my unit or units. It depends yes. if you are having like domains, like uh, you know, um, delivery room, and then if you have C-section done there or in the OR and then you have maternity and then you have neonatal and then, you know, it depends yeah. in your country. So let's say I'm responsible for that at the clinical level. I need to know if my people are performing according to those indicators that we mm -hmm. have. Though. Do they have the competencies? Mm -hmm. um, we presented that to the BFHI network into webinars. Like we were explaining, for example, if I want to uh, try, I could try the whole thing, you know, say, okay, let's go and have everybody do all the questions at the knowledge level. And then I'll be able to identify where are the gaps. And then I could organize for my team or parts of my teams, depending, this type of continuing education mm -hmm. instead of everybody goes for 20 hours. Mm -hmm. So that could be like this. It could be that there's a group of uh, physician, you know, who are coming like with new residents and all this. Okay, I decide I want to know how they are. And then what I want to give them as training as a group. Mm -hmm. So let's go to have the questions. Once you have all your questions, you identify the gap. And then as a group, you can have it. You can do it for one new person. OK, mm -hmm. I would tell you here in Quebec in May, let most of the graduates come and they are brand new. So they may have the knowledge, they may not have it. What I would do would be 
part of that orientation they have to the hospital have all those questions there. Mm -hmm. So I will know then when they go to the unit, say this group is poorer in this area, mm -hmm. it's stronger in this area. So let's focus on this. It could be with quality circle. I want like the BFHI has been implemented, but we always need to upgrade yep. and upgrade yep. and upgrade. So I want to test, is my people still are still up to date with our competencies? So, okay, let's go with the knowledge. And then if it works, then you can go to case study together in circle. And it could be by, for example, I want to know about step four. Mm -hmm. So I will look at the knowledge just for step four. And then I will go with case study discussion in step four, either multidisciplinary or discipline by discipline. It depends on of your context. And then observation audits, you got the tools there. So you go and check as a group, how are they performing? What are they doing? What can I better in my own team? So it's really a quality of care tool. Mm -hmm. So uh, BFHI is, so the toolkit is just along with this. Okay, that's, that's brilliant. Um, any key messages for, for um, uh, hospitals that are heading towards baby-friendly um, uh, certification um, in the up and coming years? I guess the same thing I just said. I would, I would uh, use the new tools to know where my people are okay. and just to try to prepare them, you know, for the assessment or reassessment. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, not only focusing on VFHI certification, but mm -hmm. what kind of service am I offering to diets coming in my hospital? And, and be proud of what I'm offering, but even prouder if I know that, because this toolkit, those competencies are the basics. It's basic, basic. What if my team is all having, has all this basic? Well, hell, you know, I'll go higher and higher and give them more. Because why are we there? We're there for the diets that, you know, they come to the hospital and for one of the most important time of their lives, you know, giving birth is something you remember all your life. Yeah. <laughs> of yeah. course, yeah. you have the kids to remember also <laughs> because they are there. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's just uh, to this toolkit is a tool really to yeah. help us better the type of uh, care and services we can offer. Yeah. So we're, we're challenging our basis of care based on best practice, um, uh, good evidence, um, so. and ensuring that we've got a quality care um, that's provided to all the dyads. Uh, so and I would a... say, you know, the toolkit identified the basics. Mm -hmm. If as a healthcare professional, professional, I know that this is what I'm supposed to know and show and demonstrate, I cannot say I don't know because it's there now, mm -hmm. you know? So, it, I mean, if a whole team wants to be up to date with what they offer as professional service, they cannot say, well, we don't know really what's expected. Mm -hmm. We know internationally speaking, this is what is expected. That's the basics. Yeah. You can go further. Hopefully you'll go further, but at least this is the basics for all healthcare professionals. Yeah. Thank you so much, Louise. As always, I love chatting with you. We have a great time. You make a difference in the fact that we, you know, this is best practice, you know, and um, I think everybody's goal is simply to make sure that the, you know, the families, the dyads um, get the best care possible. And as, as health professionals, um, we have a responsibility to make a difference there. So um, yep. again, thank, thank you me. so much. <laughs> Okay. Have it a great nice. day. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>